everybody for coming today. Um, Kristen Yaris is going to get us started. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. And thank you for being a part of our second webinar organized by the Anthropologist Action Network for Immigrants and Refugees. The network is a coalition of anthropologists working at campuses across the country. We first came together at the 2016 AAA meetings in Minneapolis, forming an umbrella organization through which we coordinate our advocacy and other activities on behalf of immigrant refugee students and communities. I'm Kristen, and I'm an assistant professor of international studies at the University of Oregon and one of the founding members of the network. Earlier this year, several network members published a cultural anthropology hotspot series based upon our work. That series responded to questions relevant for our discussion today, including how has our work as anthropologists changed in order to protect vulnerable students, colleagues, and research participants in the last two years? How can we create proactive policies and practices to counter bias, discrimination, and hostility towards immigrants and refugees on our campuses and in our communities? And how can we join national policy and legislative efforts to protect immigrant and refugee communities? How is this work shaped by the different political climates and types of institutions in, in which we work? Today's webinar is organized alongside the hotspots issue in order to examine how the current political climate, including its anti-immigrant, anti-refugee discourse and policy agenda, heightens the state's stakes of our work as US-based scholars and activists. The hotspots series also explores the potentialities of practicing an engaged anthropology with those currently framed as immigrant refugee outsiders in the contemporary period of heightened ethno-nationalism. We're very thankful to the American Anthropological Association for generously supporting and publicizing this webinar and for providing the technical assistance of the platform on which we're speaking today. Our discussion will be focused around three topic areas. First, recent legislative and policy updates related to immigration and refugees. Second, we will have reports from red states namely Texas and in, in Indiana, hearing how campus communities are organizing in hostile climates. And third, we will hear about issues of immigration enforcement in the interior of the US and its effect on vulnerable and precariously documented communities. I'm gonna pause really briefly to ask you to mute your microphone and the mute button is at the bottom left corner of your screen. So everyone who's not speaking, please do mute your mics. You can also shut down your camera so that um, if you don't want your video image to be uh, projected. Thank you for muting your audio. It helps with the background noise. So today we have five speakers on these three topics who are JC Salyer from Columbia University, Wendy Volt from Indiana University, Purdue, Indianapolis, Mariela Nunez Janes from the University of North Texas, William Lopez from University of Michigan, and Whitney Duncan from the University of Northern Colorado. Each speaker will talk for about eight minutes, sharing their remarks, and we'll have about a half an hour at the end for a discussion Q&A. So as we go, you can use your chat function, um, the Zoom group chat, to send your chats or questions out, and we will respond to them at the end of the session. So Lauren Heidrink of Cal State University Long Beach will also be facilitating our Q&A at the end. So for now, we're going to go ahead and move on to our overview of legislative and policy issues um, with JC. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers and for AAA for facilitating this. Um, I just want to start by explaining that I'm both uh, an anthropologist, but I'm also an immigration lawyer. I run the immigration clinic at a nonprofit in Brooklyn, the Arab American Family Support Center. So in addition to having an academic interest in these topics, I also have hundreds of clients that are directly affected by these sorts of policies. Um, First, I think it's important to recognize that sort of beyond all the rhetoric about illegal immigration and criminal aliens and the fixation on a border wall and even the Islamophobia of these of the um, sort of national security claims for this Muslim travel ban, um, you know, that this administration is really anti-immigrant 
in general in a way that administrations haven't been for um, you know for quite a few decades. Um, and some of these developments I'm going to talk about, um, you know, from the travel ban to restrictions on family-based immigration to uh, redefining what public charge means, uh, show that they're hostile to immigration in general, um, not just immigration, um, you know, in terms of undocumented or irregular immigration. Um, this slide here is um, my attempt at a little Marx joke. Everybody loves Marx jokes. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that a lot of the policies and ideas that Trump is is using right now come from a very fringy extreme area. Um, this is a picture from the administration's transition team. Um, that's Chris Kobach, who's currently the Kansas um, Secretary of State. Um, he's been the architect of a lot of state level anti-immigration laws, including SB 1070 in Arizona, the so-called show me your papers law. Um, and this picture is actually was you know, sort of taken while they were meeting and it uh, captured the sort of agenda item he brought, which shows that um, increasing border patrol, banning Syrian refugees, uh, imposing extreme vetting on um, Muslim immigrants were all part of the agenda he brought to that meeting. Um, and so even though, um, you know, the sort of origins of these ideas um, come from a fairly fringy uh, set of extremists. Um, they've been implemented by the administration with very tragic consequences for the individuals and families affected. Um, can I see the next slide, please? Um, the, you know, obviously one of the areas we've heard a lot about is the travel ban, the so-called Muslim travel ban, which is currently pending before the Supreme Court. There was just an oral argument on this case on April 25th. Um, currently, eight individuals from eight countries are banned from receiving immigrant visas to the United States and most other kinds of visas. Uh, in my practice at the Arab American Family Support Center, I work with many Yemeni American families who are attempting to bring their spouses, their children, and their parents to the United States, but are being prevented from doing so because of this ban. Um, the situation is particularly tragic because, as you all well know, there's a brutal civil war going on in Yemen. There is a sort of accompanying humanitarian crisis with food insecurity, a cholera outbreak. Um, so the families I work with are desperate to try and bring their family members here. And if it weren't for this travel ban, they would be entitled to do that. Um, just yesterday, I was working with a Yemeni man who um, was trying to bring his wife and child to the U.S. And contrary to what the administration's lawyer argued in the Supreme Court, which was there is a exemption or a waiver process that families can ask for, um, that is not being afforded people. Um, they're simply being told that they have to wait to see what the Supreme Court has, what the Supreme Court decides. Um, another area that um, the administration has been uh, quite different than other administrations has been is the refugee admissions. Um, the United States has always been somewhat uh, inadequate in terms of meeting its humanitarian obligations, uh, but under the Trump administration that has gone from bad to almost non-existent. Uh, for instance, in 2016, the Obama administration admitted about 15,500 Syrian refugees. In 2017, the Trump administration admitted only about 3,000. And so far in 2018, only 11 Syrian refugees have been admitted. Um, currently, uh, there are more displaced people and refugees in the world than any time since World War II. Um, nonetheless, during this sort of period of humanitarian crisis, the Trump administration first banned refugee admissions for 120 days once he took office and then reduced the number of overall refugee admissions to 45,000 uh, for, the, for the year, uh, which was down from 100,000 under the Obama administration. Um, you know, sort of related issues. Um, the Trump administration has removed temporary protected status for hundreds of thousands of people from Haiti, from El Salvador, from Nicaragua, from Nepal, um, and put these families in a very difficult position where they need to decide, are they gonna try and stay in the United States with their US and family members or take their children back to countries uh, where these children have never been before. Um, in terms of interior enforcement, I think some of the other presenters are gonna talk very specifically about enforcement actions that are taking place. Um, but I do wanna talk about a few of the main changes that have occurred. Um, there's increased resources and personnel going to immigration enforcement. 
Um, there's been an abandonment of guidelines and rules that protected uh, certain so-called sensitive locations like hospitals and schools and courthouses from immigration enforcement. And there's been sort of a lack of prioritization of cases and a removal of prosecutorial discretion to decide which cases should be priorities, who is a serious case as opposed to maybe a sympathetic family that should not be a priority for immigration enforcement. Uh, Trump's executive order entitled Enhancing Public Security in the Interior of the United States uh, ordered that immigration laws be enforced against, quote, all removable aliens. Um, and obviously the removal of DACA protection is sort of the most extreme and well-known uh, removal of prosecutorial discretion that's occurred. Um, the detention issue has been an increasing problem since uh, 1996, where a series of anti-immigrant amendments to the Immigration Nationality Act made it both mandatory and easier for the government to detain a whole host of different uh, aliens, including asylum seekers. Um, under Trump's executive orders, they've increased the budget to build new facilities and contract with private security companies to increase the amount of capacity for detention, uh, primarily along the American border. Um, and um, the overall detention space to 40,000 uh, yeah, 40, beds per day. Uh, that are available, and they plan to increase that in fiscal year 2019 by another 10,000 beds. Um, the private uh, prison companies that run these prison, uh, these immigration prisons are the prim primary beneficiaries. About 65% of detainees are in private prisons, for-profit prisons, um, and it's sort of telling that the day after the election, um, the stock prices of these private prison corporations skyrocketed um, in some cases as much as 85% increases in one day. Um, the public charge issue is actually sort of a breaking issue. Um, the administration is floating a new regulation or a rule that would um, increase this, this idea of public charge as a bar to immigration. Um, it's one of the oldest immigration bars. Um, it's been in place for over 100 years, um, but the Trump administration wants to expand it so that immigrant families that have used uh, government services like temporary aid to need families, uh, CHIP assistance, that's child uh, health insurance program, or food stamps, or even Head Start programs may be considered public charges. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the sort of most fundamental things that the Trump administration has attacked is the so-called chain migration idea. Um, under the Immigration and Nationality Act, the concept of family unity has sort of been at the heart of U.S. immigration policy, if, if somewhat imperfectly. Uh, every year, the vast majority of immigrant visas go to family-based immigration categories. Um, the Trump administration has disparagingly called this uh, family unity doctrine chain migration um, and is claiming that they want to replace it with uh, merit-based migration. They claim that uh, chain migration is uh, you know, a threat to national security. Um, I think there's obvious implications, ethical and policy-based, about what kind of sense it makes to separate families uh, and sort of uh, promote drain, brain drain around the world um, you know, by switching from a family-based policy to a merit-based policy. Um, can you see the next slide, please? And then I just want to briefly sort of talk about how the communities I've been working with uh, and in uh, have responded. Um, the Yemeni community in Brooklyn has responded with a series of Know Your Rights presentations, protests, um, and a couple bodega strikes, which are my favorite uh, action that have taken place. Um, where bodega owners have closed their stores to protest the fact that their families are being kept out of the United States by the Muslim travel ban. Um, this is actually a picture of the bodega strike that took place um, the day before the oral argument in the Supreme Court. Um, and the other thing that um, I think is, is sort of interesting and important is, um, even though it precedes the Trump administration, um, the New York Family Unity or Family Immigrant Unity Project um, is one of sort of the most important developments that shows how local communities can respond to unjust and unfair immigration laws. Beginning in 2013, the New York City Council started 
funding a program to provide lawyers to anyone that was in detention and facing deportation. Um, and since that time, it's become the first in the nation universal representation for folks in detention facing deportation um, and is now sort of being modeled by other jurisdictions around the country. Um, it's vastly improved people's ability to win their immigration cases. Uh, it's kept families together and it's combated sort of the discourse about what kinds of people are facing immigration uh, deportation by having representat representatives that can both go and put their cases together in court and talk to the media about the sorts of cases that are being prosecuted now. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Mariela Nunez James um, and I'm currently faculty at UNT um, at the University of North Texas in the North um, Texas region. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the context first um, before I move on to some recent developments and then some lessons that we can learn from what's been happening in Texas. Um, so in terms of my work, I have been working with undocumented youth um, in particular for over a decade. Um, and that work in my case has uh, focused on how undocumented youth um, unlearn and learn the stigma of illegality. Um, and I have chosen Texas in part because I live here and I teach here, um, but Texas also has a very unique relationship when it comes to immigration and immigration policy. Um, Texas was the first state in 2001 uh, to provide in-state tuition for undocumented students. And Texas has been at the forefront forefront of attacks against DACA uh, and most recently as you may have heard yesterday uh, our, our Attorney General um, filed um, a lawsuit um, against the federal government um, to try to officially um, end the DACA program. So in this slide, I wanna um, show you sort of the historicity of our relationship with immigration in Texas, particularly as it plays out um, in campuses like mine. So on the left of your screen, you see uh, a screenshot from an article published by the Texas Observer in 2005 about an event that was hosted by the Young Conservatives of Texas in my campus called Catch an Illegal Immigrant Day. And on the top of that uh, image, you see uh, a shirt that says, catch me um, if you can. And um, what the event consisted of was YCT members running around my campus with those t-shirts. And if you caught one of them, then you could get a 10,000 grand um, chocolate bar and then learn about um, immigration. Uh, fast forward to 2017, and then you see images like the one on the right, which are flyers that have appeared on our campuses, including mine, um, um, over and over, at least in my campus, three to, four, um, three to four times. In both of those instances, students uh, have organized. In 2005, students um, created a group called Mueve, Movimiento Unido Estudiantil Vida Eterna, which I co-advise. And then in 2017, students of my campus um, organized um, along with students uh, from Texas Women's University, which is a other university located next to, um, close to my, close to UNT. Um, they organized Sanctuary um, UNT. And as you can see, sort of the, from the flyer on the right, uh, part of the resistance has consisted in changing the narrative related to um, undocumented um, immigrants and undocumented migration. Next slide, please. So let me talk about some recent uh, policy developments developments in Texas. Um, obviously, JC has painted some of the, the broad picture um, related to um, enforcement. Um, and here in Dallas, uh, in particular, we have felt the brunt of that enforcement in the, in, in the sense that um, the border has gotten closer and closer to our communities. So Texas has actually, um, ex or Dallas in particular, has experienced 
represents the highest ice increase in ice related arrests in, in the nation, um, an overall increase from 2016 to 2017 of over um, 6,000 arrests, uh, all, most of them for nonviolent cr crimes. Um, in the city of Denton, where my university is located, as you see on the image uh, in, the, in the left, um, we had Homeland Security show up um, unexpectedly um, at our transportation center, which is a center where um, the local trains, as well as the buses that run um, throughout the DFW area um, meet. Um, it was unexpected in the sense that according to local authorities, um, they were not aware that the that DHS was going to be present. Um, and uh, an investigation by the reporter showed that the unit that was present was a Viper unit, which is a unit from the TSA. Um, and that unit is so, um, usually deployed when it comes to preventing uh, or curtailing terrorist um, attacks. And it's very unclear um, exactly what they're able to do or not to do when it comes to actually enforcing and inquiring about a person's um, immigrant um, status. But obviously this caused a, a lot of fear um, among our community, particularly um, students. Um, in addition to enforcement in Texas, we have also experienced uh, a surge of the signing of 287G agreements, which are agreements that allow local law enforcement to act as federal enforcement um, agents. Um, and in particular, in particular, Texas has added 18 additional counties in the last year to the counties um, that have 287G agreements. Those counties are mostly located along the U.S.-Mexico border, although one of them is actually located in the DFW area, which is Tarrant County, where the city of Fort Fort Worth resides. Uh, and this increase in surge in 287G agreements um, has happened nationwide. There are currently 60 uh, counties that have 287G agreements in the nation. And again, those increases have um, happened during the past year. Um, and in terms of local legislation, last year, in the spring of last year, our governor um, signed Texas SB4, or an anti-sanctuary uh, bill, as it was called, which actually forces um, local law enforcement to inquire about a person's citizenship and potentially their, their status. And it actually penalizes local government, um, as well as employees, if they do not comply with um, um, as before. Um, the, this particular bill uh, was challenged and sort of partly shut down through the courts, uh, but just recently in March of 2018, it was um, almost completely um, put into effect and the law was mostly left intact. Uh, and it's a particular concern, not only for the community at large, but also um, for um, our local universities and community colleges, because it allows campus police, again, to uh, inquire about immigration status. And it also uh, forces community colleges um, to fall under the purview of SB4. So in that context, it's sort of this increasing oppression in um, local enforcement, um, community organizations as well as student activists have engaged in a variety of strategies which have focused mostly on staying inward um, and kind of working at the grassroots level and within the community. So there are a lot of DACA renewal workshops um, and naturalization workshops that are taking place as a way to kind of um, utilize existing um, opportunities and existing protections. Um, there have been uh, campaigns of acompañamiento or accompaniment of literal uh, accompanying um, individuals who are checking in to um, with ICE or who are going to court hearings. Lots, lots of uh, know your rights and family preparedness workshops that also are taking place sort of privately and under the, the public radar as a way to kind of diminish the fear and the potential backlash. Um, we 
have seen also in the last year um, some new dreamer centers which are first for for texas um, so one at ut san antonio and another one that just opened last um, week at mountain view college here in the dfw area and lastly educate the the educators um, despite the fact that in texas we were the first to have in-state tuition there are still lots of misconceptions about um, in-state tuition and about um, the rights of uh, students on their campuses and the rights of, of teachers. Next slide, please. So um, to close, I just want to talk very briefly about some lessons related to how we can move forward, particularly when it comes to um, the case of Texas, right, where we have experienced for decades severe oppression and persecution of the immigrants, com immigrant communities. Um, I think it's important for us as anthropologists and also as educators to engage community activists, to kind of follow the, their lead, um, to engage organizers and to work directly with, um, not necessarily only for the communities that are affected. So I think we need to talk together, invite them to webinars like this one, go to their places where they organize and where they strategize and start to build some more coalition um, across um, academic units as well as um, um, organizers and activists. We need to um, work strategically, both locally, nationally, and internationally, and this is happening at the grassroots level, uh, where there's a lot of intersectional um, organizing taking place. Um, it's important that we deepen our advocacy within our institutions, uh, both advocacy of undocumented students, but again, as we engage more deeply um, and work strategically with grassroots movements, um, with um, local organizations, it is important that also we start working on things like our tenure guidelines, right? The recognition of activist scholarship as significant and, and as important. Um, and lastly, I think we need to leverage our position to coordinate efforts so that our own institutions work uh, proactively rather than reactively. And this is a lesson that we learn, particularly as SB4 was starting to develop um, at the state legislature where there was a lot of kind of a wait and see um, attitude. And so it's important that we, take a, uh, that we take the opportunities that we have and we try to push forward, right? Uh, when we have those opportunities available. Um, next slide. So I just wanted to quickly show you a very practical example of some of the things that um, we are doing in working with um, community organizations. Um, so this is a roadmap to college that I develop with the North Texas Dream Team, which is a youth led um, on a, a group that is led by undocument, undocumented youth in the DFW area. Uh, and what's important is what's on the backside and if you can um, change the slide, please. Um, so these are some things to keep in mind and it's important um, to locally for us to remind students and educators that despite the backlash, despite the persecution and the increasing oppression, um, SB 1528 and state tuition in Texas remains untouched. Um, and so there is still help um, available. And so we're providing their information about um, what it takes to be able to qualify for SB 1528 um, and ways in which um, students and educators can stay um, informed um, through some of the activities and workshops that the North Texas Stream Team provides. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Wendy Vogt. Thank you for um, all the organizing efforts and for inviting me to participate in this webinar. It's, it's really inspiring to see how many people are here taking time. I know it's a crazy time of the semester for everyone to be here. Just a quick reminder, um, for new people to mute your, um, your screens and you can turn your video off if you would like on the bottom left hand corner of your page. Um, so I am here to talk about the, the great state of Indiana. Um, I have lived in Indiana since 2012 and in 2011 
uh, the state passed SB 590, which was basically a copycat bill of Arizona's um, SB 1070, which is an extremely anti-immigrant bill. And for the purposes of coming to a university here at IUPUI, it effectively um, banned undocumented students from receiving any type of federal and state tuition um, or, or aid. Or, so they needed to pay out of state tuition. So no aid for those students. And so when I uh, got here, um, and since then, I've been working with a, a local organization called the Indiana Undocumented Youth Alliance that has been um, doing work to raise scholarships. They've raised over $20,000 in scholarships for undocumented students in Indiana across the state, um, as well as money for DACA renewals, which has become increasingly important as we've seen. Um, and they've also branched out to um, begin doing um, Know Your Rights workshops and working with local community groups. And I'll talk a little bit of, uh, more about that um, in a couple minutes, but um, first I want to kind of give a little bit of the context of Indiana and at the state level. Um, last week when I was thinking about uh, doing this webinar uh, last Tuesday, and I think, well, what's happening today in Indiana? Um, there had been a lot of um, you know, social media and activists a movement around the um, um, deportation proceedings against one um, Indianapolis mother. She's a mother of two children, U.S. citizen children, um, and she and her husband and the kids, while they were at home, their house was raided by ICE. Um, they believe that there was a traffic violation, and that's how they um, clued ICE into the fact that they might be undocumented. Um, ICE deport, um, detained and deported her husband. And now this woman um, is wearing an ankle bracelet, this mother, and um, is, um, has to attend her you know, bi-weekly check-ins um, with um, Department of Homeland Security. So there was a lot of um, you know, movement around this. Local faith leaders accompanied her to her check-in at Department of Homeland Security and a lot of activism and it was wonderful to see, but I also um, noted and wanted to point out that on that same day, Tuesday, April 24th, last week, um, there were two other raids in the state of Indiana. In Northern Indiana, um, in, a, in a city called Highland, um, ICE agents arrested eight construction workers who were sitting on the grass um, near the apartment building where they were putting new roofing onto an apartment building. Um, they were um, there to uh, look for um, somebody who had failed to register as a sex offender and in that process were um, able to detain um, eight, seven other people working at the construction site who were eating lunch. Um, on the same day in Plainfield, Indiana, which is just located outside Indianapolis, three Mexican restaurants were um, targeted and raided. Um, looking for some, someone that ICE called a criminal alien fugitive. Um, and they ended up detaining 15 people from Mexico and Central America um, on that day. So I think that it's important when we're, you know, thinking about doing this work and this activism and our networks, you know, something that I've been thinking about is how can we, you know, what can we do as scholars, as activists in addressing some of these, you know, surprise raids? What can we do in rural areas where we don't have the resources, where we don't have the activist networks in place to attend, you know, like we did in Indianapolis to attend the, the check-in of this mother um, and, Maybe um, I'm hoping William Lopez will have a little more to say about raids and what we can do at that level. Um, one thing, one thing, that, thing, thing. Um, that we've been doing, doing with Ayuya, the Indiana, 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 Indiana my um, uh, volume, sir, volume, my sir. sounds a little sounds weird. A little so weird, hopefully, hopefully, does that sound okay that to sound everyone? Okay to everyone? I don't know if you can, I, I can't hear you, so. Anyways, um, to the next there's slide. A, there's a slight echo, uh, Wendy, but that's okay, I think. Okay, okay. Can everyone just make sure that they uh, muted their, their, their microphone? microphone? It's on the bottom left. I think there's a couple people who haven't muted. Okay. That's actually a lot better. Thank okay. you for muting. Thank you. Um, so one thing that I think we can begin to do in more rural areas, oh, you can go to the next slide, uh, Lauren, thank you, um, is doing Know Your Rights workshops in rural areas where there aren't 
uh, local resources and organizations that are tending to those communities, um, farm worker communities, um, places where we don't already have those networks and people ready to call in if, if ICE shows up. Um, and thinking about developing partnerships with universities, with community colleges um, in rural areas, um, I think is, is something really important that we can do in terms of sharing resources and knowledge and, and coalitions. Another thing that I've been really inspired um, by on my campus is the kind of intersectional coalition building between different student groups on campus. Um, something that we've talked about a lot with my, our Muslim students and our undocumented students is kind of the everyday levels of fear, you know, fears of surveillance, fears of, um, of, of you know, people coming and taking family members away, um, you know, tr the travel ban. So there's kind of, you know, areas where people have overlapping experiences. And I'm seeing on my campus that some of these student groups are beginning to come to dialogue and talk to each other. And in some cases, in formal ways, uh, two weeks ago, um, and you can see this on kind of the second poster, um, the red poster that says seeing ourselves in each other. We had a forum on campus where um, students from different groups, including Students for Justice in Palestine, the Black Student Union, Native American Student Alliance, the Dreamers Alliance, which is our local campus um, group, and the Muslim Youth Collective came together, so local student leaders, and this was all student initiated, um, to come together to discuss issues around Palestine. Um, and it was just a fabulous event to see how local, you know, local leaders and students are are you know talking to each other and supporting each other and, and finding solidarity. Um, so I think that's something that we might be able to do with our students on our campuses um, in order to increase those dialogues and really kind of build those intersectional coalitions. Um, another program that maybe some of you all have on your campuses is a Tunnel of Oppression. Um, it's based off of uh, exhibit uh, interactive theater at the Tolerance uh, Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. Lots of universities have it to kind of look at different mar experiences of different marginalized groups. So this year I'm um, helping assist a student who are a student group that's looking at deportation and um, making visible, right, making visible um, the stories of immigrants and in diverse and nuanced ways um, that I think isn't always visible. And I think that's also a really powerful thing that we can be doing on our campuses, those kinds of activities and um, pushing for that in addition to resources for our DACA students and undocumented students. So the final slide, um, and I apologize for kind of jumping now to the next level, um, going from state to local to transnational, but um, my, most of my work um, is on Central American migration, and I've really been kind of, you know, just in shock, and I'm sure all of you are following what's happening with the, with the migrant caravan and what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border in Tijuana. Um, these migrant caravans are not new. Um, I attended one over 10 years ago in Mexico, um, even though now there's this complete hysteria around it. And you know, these migrant caravans serve a purpose for um, providing assistance and humanitarian aid for people who are traveling through Mexico, which is an extremely dangerous and in many cases deadly crossing. Um, but what I've been most kind of a surprise, or I guess I'm not really surprised by anything anymore, but is the way that the Central American migration and asylum seekers is being conflated now with DACA. Um, and so just, just for fun to read two recent tweets from our president, um, border patrol agents are not allowed to properly do their job at the border because of ridiculous liberal Democrat laws like catch and release, getting more dangerous, caravans coming, Republicans must go to nuclear option to pass tough laws now. No more DACA deal, okay? And then another tweet, these big flows of people are all trying to take advantage of DACA. They want in on the act. And so it's just, it's completely, you know, this hysteria and um, absurd to be treating asylum seekers, right? Or people who are um, hoping to, to be, become refugees as, the same, right, as, as DACA um, recipients in the United States, um, but also, and this is really in the last few weeks, the ways that 
um, asylum is becoming criminalized and the language around um, the people who are seeking asylum in the United States um, are becoming more and more criminalized. And this is something that we've seen um, with immigrant groups, right, for the last, I don't know, a couple hundred years in US history. Um, and the final point that I wanna make kind of at this transnational level is just to think about um, the rippling effects of all these policies, right? We think about US state policy and US state violence um, at the border, and we think about it in the interior of our communities, but we also need to think about it beyond um, beyond our borders and the ways that um, U.S. state policies has shaped Mexican immigration enforcement, for example. Mexico uh, deports more Central Americans than the United States does now. Um, and as I mentioned, it, you know, the journey through Mexico is increasingly dangerous, um, but it's also impacting families across the Americas and across the world. Um, another part of my work is working with families of missing and uh, disappeared migrants who have either died while crossing the U.S.-Mexico border or are uh, detained in prisons um, or, or different facilities in the United States and trying to establish, find people, find family members and establish lines of connection when we are able to locate someone who is in detention um, through letters and things like that. So thinking about those rippling effects um, and the ways that the uncertainty for those families is another form of violence against immigrants. Thank you. Hello, um, thanks for inviting me to speak with you today. So my name is William Lopez. and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, so the main focus of my work centers on immigration enforcement home raids and the multi-level health impacts these acts of enforcement can have. But part of what I want to discuss and, and the secondary focus of my work is the ways in which these immigration raids shape the entire community in which they occur. Um, so this is because these raids are not only violent individual acts of enforcement, but they also end up serving as stark reminders of the power of ICE of Immigration and Customs Enforcement to engage in these violent, racist, and militarized enforcement acts whenever they want. Uh, so in this raid, these raids are both like public shacklings and executions, right? So they instill fear of what can happen in front of you, um, of what's happening in front of you, but also what could happen any day at any moment uh, if you do not fall in line with a largely white capitalist structure in place in the US. Um, so in my dissertation work in the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, I looked at an immigration raid that took place a few miles from my university, and this happened uh, in the winter of 2013. Uh, normally I'll present many of the slides kind of to tell the story, but this, is, this slide shows ultimately what happened at the end of the day. I used the Freedom of Information Act, uh, participant observation, and interviews with those involved in order to grasp the impact of this collaborative raid that happened, the impact that happened to the individuals, the families, and the communities involved. Um, so briefly, you see at the bottom corner, uh, marked D, this apartment was raided at about 6.30 p.m., again in the winter of 2013. And this particular raid was a collaborative effort between local police um, and ICE, and the local police provided a SWAT team or a special weapons and tactics unit. Um, the history of the SWAT team is extensively important here because SWAT teams developed largely uh, after the war on drugs, injected money in police departments, money in militarized equipment in police departments. Uh, when these funds were earmarked for, for drug use to, to target drug users, SWAT teams began to be used to target folks who are allegedly selling drugs, and that's what happened in this place. So we see somebody who was deported across the border, he returned, um, a stakeout said, officer said he was selling drugs, so a SWAT team collaborated with ICE, um, eventually kicked in the door to his apartment and arrested everyone, all the men involved, uh, all the men who were in there, leaving behind the mothers with children. Um, but as you see, A, B, C, um, all the, the other folks who drove away from this, from this apartment were also arrested. And it was very clear the pattern who was being arrested, right? So there's every Latino male who drove away from these, this place was arrested. Um, so what the community saw was this hyper violent enforcement. And it was violent enforcement that was also militarized uh, and that specifically targeted uh, brown people. 
Um, it resulted in about half a dozen deportations. And as we show in our research, trauma and PTSD-like reactions from the mothers and the children in the raided apartment. Um, and along with this came hunger and homelessness as the door was broken down and not fixed, um, and acute poverty from families who lost their breadwinners to detention and deportation. Uh, next slide, please. So, but the piece I shared with the network wasn't necessarily about the raid, uh, it was about something ostensibly different at least. It was about La Migra or Customs and Border Patrol being in our campus at the University of Michigan uh, and the rage and the fear that this stoked among our Latino and mixed status community here in our campus. Uh, you can see the picture on the right of La Migra parked in front of the students, uh, student center. Um, and for those of you on campuses, you can imagine the kind of reaction that you and your students could have to seeing something like this. Um, now what happened was that the administration was shocked that we were so angry, right? Which only served to anger us more that they didn't understand the source of this anger. Um, but that anger and the ignorance of its cause kind of illustrates a fundamental aspect of immigration enforcement often missed by those who do not live in these mixed status communities. Um, so that is the patrullas of La Migra, the police cars, um, the, the patrol cars of ICE. Um, just like the raid, these serve as reminders of what could happen of the race-based militarized violence that could result in the removal of your family on any given day. And our campus administrators saw La Migra's presence as something unlikely to result in violence since they were allegedly just there for a career fair. But we all saw it as a stark reminder of what could happen, what could happen if an agent arbitrarily decided to make it so, right? In our heads was not an agent going to talk to recruit Wolverines to, to be in the Border Patrol. Um, but images of, of the people who had arrested our families, who had raided the, the taller so many, you know, a few miles from our, from our university. Um, and so often, as you can see in the picture on the right, uh, so the picture on the right is a police car. So sometimes when police collaborate with, with Immigration and Customs Enforcement or with La Migra, the same fear that comes with seeing La Patrulla of La Migra comes with seeing uh, police cars as well. And this particular image on the left, uh, we see a police car that's outside of a, of a government organization that provides food subsidies to local families. Um, and you can imagine mixed status community members are not going to want to go to these places when they see the police who, who, who collaborated in raids um, parked in front of those buildings. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the implications we see here? So it's imperative that we reflect on the way in which immigration enforcement affects day-to-day -day mobility in these mixed status communities. We need to, and, and I don't, most, most people watching right now don't engage in this, but for many in the community who don't do this work, they think of immigration as every now and then a deportation or perhaps a raid. But what we see and what we need to push in our communities is that every day is shaped by the fear of the possibility of these, this enforcement. Um, in our own community, we've attempted to support our mixed status communities in a range of ways, sometimes not ostensibly associated with immigration enforcement. So as, and as others referenced, um, Many of us with licenses will often use them to drive those who can't drive legally to check in with their DHS appointments. Uh, we often engage what we and others call cultural navigation or what Dr. Nunez Yanez calls acompañamiento and attend traffic ticket court or other court cases to support those fearful of being picked up in those offices who help, uh, need help navigating an English system. Um, we work to create safe spaces in healthcare settings advocating for a range of acceptable identification outside of driver's licenses, which are, which are not accessible to many uh, undocumented community members in the states in which we live. And we work with the administration to clarify their policies regarding the presence of ICE in clinics and if ICE should request any of the documents they have. Um, it's also critical to work with law enforcement, especially sheriff's departments to discuss um, the illegality of honoring immigrant detainers in which undocumented folks are held in their jails. Um, in, our, in Washington County, our sheriff does not hold folks just to honor ICE detainers, and it's happening more throughout the country as well. And then it's also essential to discuss with local police um, that they do not have to collaborate with ICE, that the repercussions of collaborating with ICE are spreading a fear throughout the community so that no one trusts police, no one from undocumented Latino communities are going to call and trust the police when they know they're collaborating with ICE. Um, and that it, events such as these raids uh, police are often the ones who are left after the raids um, to cope with, with what happens in their aftermath. ICE will go in there, raid the building, destroy these families, cause this trauma, and then leave. And it's important that we explain to law enforcement that they're the ones who need to 
allegedly serve and protect our communities. Um, and lastly, we've also been working through how to deal with and acknowledge the real suffering that occurs uh, during deportation, de deportation and raids and detention. Uh, as you can see in the, in the pictures on the right, we stand with families in the airport as they're removed. And we're also experimenting with providing funds to celebrate the milestones that occur after. We just recently celebrated a birthday uh, with a father whose, whose wife and the mother of his children was just deported Life goes on and it should be celebrated and our work cannot be all darkness or I think we would, wouldn't be able to continue to do it. So, thank you for your time and I look forward to hearing any questions you may have later. Okay, hi everyone. And thank you to all the presenters for these really excellent and instructive thought provoking presentations. Um, so just a reminder to mute your audio. I think everyone is all set on that, um, but just to reduce background noise. Um, so for the past year, I've been volunteering with Denver-based immigrant advocacy organizations in two main capacities. So first at a support group for people in deportation proceedings, um, and this slide is uh, an image of one of the logos of the, the group that was developed by one of the children of, the, of a member. Um, and then also as a member of the docu team, as it's called, um, that documents immigrants' interactions with and experiences of abuse by ICE and law enforcement. Um, and both of these are activities organized through local immigrant advocacy organizations that I've become involved with. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So deportation rates in Colorado and Wyoming, which are calculated together as one enforcement area, increased 150% in fiscal year 2017 compared with 2016. And this was, quote, the highest rate of increase among the nation's 25 immigrant enforcement areas, according to the Denverite newspaper and ICE arrests were up 20%. There have been multiple raids, some of which were conducted um, in explicit retaliation for Denver's sanctuary city status, and a huge number of immigrants are detained at the for-profit Geo Detention Center, which is now actually embroiled in a class action lawsuit um, for subjecting detainees to forced manual labor. So despite the fact that Denver has been a leader in the sanctuary movement in many ways, um, a lot of the immigrant communities are, as in the communities we've heard about throughout the webinar, living in this climate of fear, anxiety, you know, vigilance and mistrust. So in the hotspots piece, I decided to focus on community organizing um, instead of my on-campus efforts, partially because I've just been so struck by the role and process of acompañamiento or accompaniment, as a couple of us have, have mentioned, in this informal setting. So I'm trying to think through really what is acompañamiento in the setting that I'm observing and participating in and sort of theorizing it and, and thinking through it as a potential model moving forward because I've been very impressed um, with its function and, and how it works with the immigrant communities that I've been working with. So unlike at a university, accompaniment is not mediated by an institution besides these grassroots immigrant, immigrant advocacy organizations nor can members appeal to a particular institution for you know, recognition or resources. So acompañamiento emerges in response to violence and neglect by the very state that is supposed to be protecting rights. And again, we've heard multiple examples of this by other presenters. So while allies certainly accompany in various ways, as I try to do, um, at least in this context, it's really immigrants supporting immigrants, um, which I think is important to note. And that translates to significant demands on members, um, which is potentially a drawback to this model, depending on your, your sort of views about it. But it also means that members themselves, so directly impacted people, are driving many of the group decisions. Um, they're devising creative forms of mutual support, and they are working from their very fraught and vulnerable positions even to try to affect legislative change. So I want to describe briefly how the support group and the docu team work before discussing acompañamiento and um, how it's rooted in the realities of local policies and concerns. So here's a hypothetical case. Say a man named Eduardo goes to his regular ICE check-in. Um, and since ICE has been directed by the Trump administration to crack down in the interior of the country and expedite removals, um, like we heard about from JC at the beginning, Eduardo's detained and sent to the GEO detention center. Eduardo's wife, Angelina, calls the Rapid Response Network hotline. So you can go to the next slide. 
And this is advertised on local radio and can be used also to report raids. Um, so touching on what, what we were just hearing about from Bill and also from Wendy. So then a volunteer would meet with Angelina to systematically take down the details of um, Eduardo's case and organize support for the family. The volunteer then might recommend that Angelina attend the monthly support group, so, which is organized by another immigrant advocacy organization. So they're working really together and in tandem. Um, so she would go to the support group to talk to others in similar situations and get acompañamiento, um, and also to strategize steps to avoid Eduardo's uh, deportation. So very importantly, it does not matter why Eduardo is in the immigration system, right? Be it for driving with a broken taillight or something potentially more egregious. Acompañamiento is a form of being with that really resists judgments and resists judgment and notions of deservingness that we hear so much about in discourses around immigration. There are no good migrants and bad migrants in this setup. So in the support group meetings, Angelina would find both emotional accompaniment and logistical political accompaniment in the form of members joining her um, in meetings with attorneys, potentially to do interpretation, organizing a vigil at the detention center, going to any hearings or check-ins that she might have to go to or that Eduardo might be going to, um, helping fill out a family plan in case he is removed, perhaps he was hosting a yard sale to raise funds for his legal, um, his legal fees. And Helena then would also be providing emotional support to others, showing up to their court dates, right? Joining in protests and um, even going to the Capitol to lobby for pro-immigrant legislation. So that's sort of how these groups work together and how they're set up. And importantly, many involved with this movement are working at both micro and more macro levels. So this includes developing and advocating for humane immigration policies at local, the local levels that address the main concerns of the immigrants um, the immigrant communities here. So a main concern is ICE holds and notifications, um, which all sheriff's offices in Colorado have agreed not to honor, not to do, but it happens anyway. And that's how a lot of people um, end up being transferred from just local jails into, into the geo detention center. There are fears about a, uh, attending court dates since there have been cases of ICE agents in courthouses here and elsewhere. Like everywhere, there are also concerns about not being able to adjust status, um, receive U visas, or even qualify for stays of removals. Those are all sort of going away as options. So these decisions often come down to the personality, preferences, and political leanings of individual judges and authorities. Um, and like we learned about from JC, this prosecut prosecutorial discretion is sort of going away. So even if they were sympathetic, they might be less likely to, to grant those uh, requests. But also, it's quite a gamble in a purple state like Colorado. So you're very unlikely to get a U visa certification in Adams County in Colorado. Um, and you need the certification to even apply for a U visa. For Versus in Denver, you might be more likely to get um, that certification. So I think this really speaks to the central importance, not only of federal policy, but also local realities um, and state, county, and municipal practices. Acompañamiento is the joint political action and emotional support that emerges from these concerns. And it acts really, to me, as a flexible form of organizing and support. So in terms of political actions, there are two that I'd just like to highlight that are collaborations between directly impacted people and um, advocacy organizations. So first is um, Virginia's Law, which was named for a Colorado-based immigrant, Virginia, uh, Virginia Mancinas, who was detained by ICE after calling to report domestic violence. This would prohibit ICE holds and ICE presence in schools, hospitals, and courtrooms, and would require law enforcement to provide immigrants written advisement of their rights. Uh, before being interviewed by ICE. It recently passed the State House Vet and Military Affairs Committee and is on its way to the Appro Appropriations Committee. And there are multiple members of the group there um, at the Capitol a couple of weeks ago lobbying for this bill. Um, it wouldn't address the underlying problems, right, that national immigration law uh, creates uh, in terms of, of, of creating these impossible situations for families, but I think it does speak to the importance of localities and crafting responses to these acute issues. Um, second, four w immigrant women in sanctuary in Colorado developed, um, two of whom are part of the support group that I'm talking about, developed the People's Resolution, which emerges directly from their experiences of an unjust, um, unfair immigration system. So this urges local and federal lawmakers to repeal ERIRA, create a path to citizenship for those with DACA and TPS, and enforce a bright line between law enforcement and ICE, among other requests. So links to these can be found at the end where we have our resources. 
Um, so overall, I've been really impressed and moved by this, these and local, other local initiatives that are being driven directly by, um, sorry, by directly impacted people who are taking considerable risks in advocating for themselves and with each other. Um, and so really trying to use my position of privilege to accompany them in this and, and figuring out um, in what ways I can do that, that are most productive. Um, Yes, and so I want to speak just really briefly to the ways in which the emotional cannot be separated from the political. And I think Bill's work really gets at this in terms of the um, mental health impacts of raids. There's a growing body of research on the very direct and detrimental mental health effects of restriction immigration policy and enforcement. Um, so a recent study by Hatson Bueller et al. illustrated that Latinos in states with exclusionary immigration policies have more um, bad mental health days than those in states with more hospitable policies. So again, here we see the profound importance of localities um, in shaping these experiences. So in the support group, mental health has recently come up as a much more explicit um, focus. So these meetings are always very emotionally charged, as you can imagine, as members are grappling, grappling with liminality, fear, anxiety, family separation. But in the past weeks, we've had counselors and psychologists join meetings to talk about self-care and available services. Um, so as someone who's written extensively on the medicalization of mental health, I, I might normally be a little bit concerned about the individualizing or depoliticizing effects of those types of services. But I'm realizing that the group um, and the forms of accompaniment it creates and provides in many ways sort of provide a, a counterbalance to that. And members certainly welcome the possibility of additional support for themselves and their families in terms of, of forms of therapy they might be able to access um, by getting information about it at these meetings. So overall, I see acompañamiento as both a political act and a form of profound care. And this is a care that explicitly challenges notions of deservingness um, and that also is flexible to respond to local realities while also pressing for broader change. Um, I think it serves an, as an instructive and, and promising example for future steps. So thank you so much and I look forward to any questions. Great, so we want to uh, thank all the presenters for their incredible presentations and also to thank the AAAs for helping to pull this together and, and to you all for taking time out of your busy days um, to, to learn more about the work that, that we're doing and we're certainly eager to hear about the work that you're doing in your communities. Um, first, we wanted to provide just some ways to be in touch with us, ways to be in contact. We do have a secret Facebook group called Protecting Undocumented Students, and you can email Whitney, who will get you hooked into that. Um, it's not searchable, so um, take down Whitney's email. We do have a website, um, anthropologistactionnetwork.org, so we suggest you take, take a look and send us any information you'd want to see posted on that, on that website. Um, all the speakers today have uh, written for cultural anthropology for our hotspots on immigration in the era of Trump. So we invite you to take, uh, take a look at their contributions. Um, I think they speak to some of these um, and additional issues. Um, and then for those that are interested um, as anthropologists um, in engaging with um, Anthropologists for Action Network for Immigrants and Refugees, we do have a Google group that you can search for. And we'll be presenting at, at the AAAs in San Jose in 2018. Um, this uh, webinar is being recorded, so you don't have to write everything down. Um, it'll be posted on the AAA's website, um, so, so these references are here uh, for the future. These are some of the organizations that were referenced um, in today's presentation, um, so uh, definitely check out their, their websites and their information, as well as we have um, some suggested reading if you're interested in any of the topics that were discussed today. Um, we have a short bibliography here, and again, this will be on the recorded webinar. Um, so to return to the question and answer, um, we would encourage you to put your questions into the chat feature. Um, I'll curate those, uh, those questions to the speakers. We invite all the speakers to, if you're comfortable, putting on your video um, and then unmuting yourself um, when the question is directed to you. Um, so perhaps the, there's two questions or two comments uh, so far in the chat box. And one was, from Jennifer Guzman, who had to uh, step away, but she said she wanted to share a little bit about the work happening in her region um, in Western New York. She said, we've been advocating for a state bill that would provide access to driver's licenses for undocumented folks. She said, we're also seeing a lot of patterns speakers are talking about with 
immigration enforcement, including raids, border patrol, transportation centers, police calling border patrol, even despite state executive orders for non-cooperation with immigration authorities. So, you know, again, in spite of these or despite these agreements, um, what's happening in practice is certainly something that um, is, is worth and important to document. Um, Anwar had a question, and perhaps this is uh, best directed at JC. Um, he said, uh, regarding the revocation of DACA, is this a definite decision? When will it be effective? Um, and is it national policy or state by state? Yeah, um, so DACA is a executive uh, action that was taken under the Obama administration, uh, as I'm sure you all know, um, you know, it is essentially setting out these priorities saying that, we, you know, there are limited resources to engage in removal. Um, so we're going to only use them in cases where it makes sense. We know as a matter, you know, of sort of policy that children that were brought to the United States against their will and have grown up here, gone to school here, um, are, you know, should be a low priority. And so it just sort of formalized that use of prosecutorial discretion. Um, what happened was when the uh, Trump administration came in and revoked the DACA um, policy, um, that was challenged in court. And so the reason parts of DACA are still in effect or because a court ordered them to stay in effect because the Trump administration didn't follow the correct Administrative Procedure Act uh, regulations when it revoked Trump, according to that court. Um, so the um, sort of revocation was ineffective according to that court. So currently there's an injunction that allows um, some of DACA to continue um, and that is nationwide. Great, thank you. Um, so from Bill, it says, thank you for the question regarding driver's licenses. Um, Bill, actually, do you just want to chime um, in? Sure, <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted to, uh, uh, question about driver's licenses. It's great to, to think about, so two things occur to me. So one is it, it is critically important um, to work for access to driver's licenses that are accessible um, to everyone, right? Including the undocumented members of our communities. Um, I'll also remind folks that often in most states, uh, it is legal to drive with a license from your country of birth. Uh, so that means for many, for us here, we have many folks with Mexican, Guatemala, and Honduran licenses, and it's legal to drive with those licenses. So a lot of it has been education and outreach to local police departments to tell them, look, you do not have to ticket these people. Um, some folks are getting ticketed and as others others said they will wind up through a, a ticket a traffic ticket in the deportation system um, and if we can just avoid this by educating officers and the uh, local police and the sheriff's department it can go a long way for those in blue counties sometimes this is a, a an option for others i understand you know this is not one way this is this is not a strategy to work with officers who are racist and who want to enforce immigration law because they still can. But again, for those in blue counties, it is one, it is one uh, avenue of, of advocacy that I'd recommend. Do you have any other questions on the floor? Kristen, do you want to unmute? Kristen? Sure, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just I was just chatting in what we were doing in Oregon. Um, so I just put that in the box. But I think I went, we just had a statewide summit um, on campus here at the University of Oregon last Friday all day where we had students, staff, and faculty and administrators from all Oregon publics and community colleges come together to talk about protecting DREAMer students, which we understand to be precariously documented students, undocumented students, DACA holders, students eligible for our state tuition equity program, and students from mixed status families. In any case, I, I feel like um, one thing I'm interested in is the different kinds of positions that different campuses and student groups are taking on sanctuary. Um, and I have some opinions about that, which I wrote in my hotspots contribution. But 
the just to point out that the students at Portland Community College Rockridge campus have used sanctuary as an organizing tool in some really innovative and effective ways and you can find a lot of that is on the PCC Rockridge campus um, and they even have a sanctuary syllabus that they got the Board of Trustees to agree. So they have a, a bit of sort of a, a policy on campus that all faculty have to include sanctuary like language in about protecting Dreamer students and what to do if ice raids campus in in their class syllabuses, which was it didn't just happen. The students really, really organized and pushed for that. So I just wanted to share a couple of things about that, but also ask anybody else who has thoughts about sanctuary and how it's how it's happening on your campuses and or you know people opposing it um, i just like to hear people's views about that so i'll speak to that a little bit um right because um our governor um last year actually threatened to cut funding for sanctuary campuses which happened as students were organizing um, in support of sanctuary and so what universities in texas have done have um they they've kind of change the language a little bit right so they they're not using the term um, sanctuary but um, they're talking about policies practices making statements uh, developing dreamer centers um, using kind of a more general language of supporting students um, supporting immigrant students um, and now supporting daca students so daca has become like this um, umbrella term um, for immigrant and undocumented students that's sort of more palatable um, and that puts institutions a little bit um, at less risk um, from um, from gubernatorial backlash. Um, however, right, as institutions are doing this, we are now under the purview of SB4. And so our campus police officers can act as ICE agents. Um, and there's still some confusion related to what um, public employees, particularly community college staff and professors cannot, cannot can and cannot say um, about immigration and about SB4 in particular. Um, so I know that TACHE, um, the Texas Association for Chicanos in Higher Education is developing some language and some guidelines, uh, especially for community um, colleges. Um, and also um, there's a, a lawsuit um, against SB4, again, that's in the works um, by Maldiv and by, by TACHE. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Jennifer Cook, who is a postdoc at SMU in Dallas. Um, she was inquiring about, you know, given kind of short time frame in which she is in Dallas, um, what are thoughts of panelists, particularly Mariela, about um, how to get involved with local work with undocumented student organizations in a short time frame? Are there ways I can be supportive in the short term beyond my inclusive approach to teaching on my campus? If anybody has ideas and wants to chime in. Sure. So locally, um, the North Texas Dream Team in the Dallas area um, has actually worked um, in conjunction with the SMU Lock Clinic for do, doing DACA renewals and Know Your Rights. Workers Defense Project is also a local um, organization that works on labor rights, but at the intersection of immigrant rights as well. And they also collaborate with um, um, SMU um, Law Clinic. Um, there is a plan um, of having a kind of gathering of lawyers, advocates, community um, organizers in the Dallas area in the summer. So sort of stay tuned uh, for announcements related um, to that, um, Jennifer. And I'm trying to organize um, as well um, a meeting and a gathering of those of us who are in higher education um, this summer to talk about um, strategizing and sharing best practices. There is a kind of a little bit of a disconnect in terms of translating what's happening at the federal level and also what's happening at the local level legislatively into how that affects um, our campuses and educational institutions in particular. Um, and so we're trying to create a group where we kind of link um, some of the resources that are being created and developed 
um, specifically um, for communities, but translating those to um, our educational institutions. So stay tuned, Jennifer. Send me an email, and then I can send you particularly uh, specific information on how to put how to stay in contact with some of the organizations that I um, talked about. I got one more thing, if that's okay, Lauren. Uh, sure. So, you know, we, we started developing a lot of these programs here in, in Washtenaw County as well. And a lot of times we depended on students. Um, and this used to be something that was challenging because especially with, especially with social work or masters in public health students, they're rotating, you get them for maybe a year. Um, eventually we started to see this as a strength. Um, we're fighting a, a federal machine, right? So what we need to do is take the best lessons from our local communities and spread them throughout the country. What we started to do is train our volunteers here to be the best they could with the system that works not only here, but to wherever they were later transplanted. Um, and I, I, you know, to, to Jennifer, I would recommend that that's something that you can do in a short time is see what's done there and what's absolutely the best. And sometimes sitting in the room observing and taking notes for a semester or a summer and then taking that lesson to the next place you go could be the best thing you do with that time. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question for uh, Whitney and Bill and, and perhaps Kristen. You know, in thinking about the kind of growing body of literature on the ways that deportation and immigration raids impact the mental health of, um, you know, I think we, there's a lot of research on their impact on US citizen children, but also on undocumented communities. Um, that is really feels like a, a growing um, and, and not quite robust uh, body of literature um, to draw upon. Has there been any efforts that you know of to reach out to organizations like the American Psychological Association to partner with, or, or perhaps even Jeff, this would be a question for you, um, to partner with the AAAs? I mean, I know the AAAs has been uh, pretty uh, kind of forthcoming and, and aggressive in terms of um, some of the, the issue papers and, and statements that, that it has uh, brought out often with the support of, of folks in this group, um, but ways in which we might kind of in our positions of privilege and in our, our particular academic and research platforms might be able to leverage this research um, to have more political impact. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to add to that, um, our, our new, um, what we call our new super committee, MPAC, um, the Members Programmatic Advisory and Advocacy Committee, um, has um, uh, special um, projects going, and one of them is on uh, this very topic. So just uh, kind of stay tuned to what we post on our website and, um, and the articles that we have coming out in Anthropology News and Anthropology News Online. Um, yeah, just stay tuned. Right now, I don't have any specific update on it, but we are looking into it and gathering experts. I think it's a really great and important idea, Lauren, and I think that um, those of us who work on mental health issues definitely can, you know, it, it's been, I think it's hard sometimes to figure out bringing together these different activities, you know, the, the activism, mental health work, research, and then tying that in with potentially larger organizational or institutional work that could um, d then lobby directly to have that data impact policy. But I think we increasingly need to have models for doing that. Um, I do think there, there is a huge body of research on you know, immigration and mental health, but then specifically how enforcement activities um, impact mental health, but also approaching it from I think an anthropologically sound way and not you know, assuming what mental health means among any particular community um, is really where anthropology can also impact the conversation. Um, so, so I appreciate that question and want to think more about how we can sort of coalesce efforts across disciplines. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Alejandro at the University of Oxford and he was asking about links of collaborations with NGOs in Mexico to help separated families. Um, I'd add two uh, organizations and then I'll turn it over to Wendy who might have more information. Um, one is Casa Alianza in Mexico City. I've worked with them quite a bit around, um, particularly in custody proceedings, um, when a child is in foster care in the US or kind of is presumed to have been abandoned when in fact the, the parent is either in detention and, and then deported. So how parents can meaningfully contribute in and participate in these types of custodial um, hearings. So they have a legal team that they've been working with. Um, the other person who um, wrote in the Hotspot series um, but couldn't be here today is Ruth Gomberg Munoz. And in her piece, she talks about some of the collaborative efforts that she's been making 
uh, with organizations in Mexico. Um, she's at uh, Loyola in Chicago. Um, so I would look at her uh, hotspots piece where she references a couple of organizations and I know she's working I think it's with Deportados Unidos uh, to try to develop this type of network because we are seeing as more parents are deported that children, whether they're US citizen children or undocumented children are, are in the States. Um, so I would certainly take a look at her, her piece. Wendy, did you wanna chime in? Yeah, um, I was also gonna recommend Ruth's piece. Um, she's working um, with returned um, deported migrants. And so I think it's IMUMI, the Instituto para las Mujeres en la Migración, um, that's doing some work um, and kind of organizing um, in Mexico, um, and it, there is a government <clears throat> program called Somos Mexicanos. Um, I think uh, Ruth has some critiques of that group, or, or there's some challenges to that government program, but I think that's kind of the official group um, that is doing that work. Um, in Oaxaca, I work with a, a group called Centro de um, Acompañamiento a Migrantes, and that works with um, deported migrants, but also for families of missing and disappeared migrants in Oaxaca. Um, I, they probably, and I work closely with them, um, might have a list of other kind of local state-based groups that are doing that type of work. Um, I don't think that there's a ton of, of, of work with separated families. Um, there's also uh, the family associations, so there's lots of families and mothers associations who are uh, working to raise awareness of disappeared children, um, either in Mexico um, or uh, crossing the border. And so those are also groups that I might look to to think about work being done with separated families. And Kristen mentioned in the comments, certainly Padre Solalinde, who's uh, quite uh, the advocate for, for families, has hermanos in el camino. Um, and so I would definitely uh, look into his, his work, um, as well as there's some other, I think, um, Otros Dreamers in Acción in Mexico City, which facilitates transition to education and certification of US-based credentials in Mexico. So there's actually been a lot of scholarship around helping US citizen or um, undocumented folks, children who are in the US get their certificates um, certified. So they might also have some connections to reach out to. Any additional questions? We've got maybe time for one more. I'm wondering, I don't know if JC can speak to this or, or other folks who um, work potentially across borders, but I am working with some families who um, sort of are anticipating uh, that one of their family members will be deported and um, they're mixed status families. And so they're considering, you know, whether the U.S. citizens should stay um, or whether they should accompany their family member back in this case to Mexico. And they have a lot of questions about, you know, should they be getting dual citizenship for their children? Um, like you just talked about educational certification, potentially if the children are going to start attending schools in Mexico. Um, how can potentially U.S. citizens who return to um, one of these, or not return to, go back to, um, go to one of the countries that their family members deported to can get legal work um, sort of status in that country? I don't know if anyone has a resource for people in those, um, those positions. Um, the Mexican consulates in general have provided resources to help that transition. Um, and in the family preparedness workshops, right, um, it is recommended that those who are in mixed status families uh, and that are able to get passports in both Mexico's or in their country of origin and in the U.S. that do so, um, particularly for children who are underage. Um, and of course, that... Um, custody issues, right? Those kinds of things are kind of arranged um, ahead of time. I'd also say on our website, um, we have some information, a PowerPoint that was put together by Ruth and some of her collaborators. It's focused on Mexico, um, but in the work that I do in, in Guatemala, it's been really helpful to think through what types of documents, what types of information um, is most useful to have um, prior to or in anticipation of, of return. Um, so definitely take a look at those PowerPoints There's, if they're in English. That guide's and, really helpful. We should, when we have that on the on your website. Yeah, okay, website. yeah, I've shared that with the group um, and, and we're putting together a 
sort of locally specific guide too. So I think it's important in terms of working with communities and families to think through, you know, encourage them to do family plans, right? Um, and gather the information they need and the potential you know, forms of identification they'll need um, just sort of to be prepared for anything that might happen. Yeah, and I think that uh, point about trying to, if, if the time allows doing that before one is uh, deported or one travels with their family member who's been deported is important because I do know there have been problems for families that move to Mexico where it's much harder to get documents to be able to prove, you know, that the child's entitled to go to school, that the child's, in, you know, uh, you know, is a Mexican citizen through their uh, parents' birth if they don't have a birth certificate from the United States that shows that family relationship, um, you know, and if the parent's not allowed to go back to the United States, uh, you know, sometimes depending on, you know, what county they're from, um, it's harder to get those documents if they're not in the United States. I think too there's been a lot of conversations around uh, legal power of attorneys, um, certainly access to bank accounts, all these things obviously with somebody you know that that is trusted somebody de confianza rather than um, kind of turning you know articulating these these documents um, prior to you know potentially a, a never returning um, but certainly going through and, and helping people to call together these different documents to scan these documents and to um, prepare again, a power of attorney in terms of custody of children, in terms of access to bank accounts um, to get funds, all those things logistically are quite difficult to do out of the US. Well, thank you. I think our time is done. Thank you all for participating. Thanks to the speakers for taking time out of your day to prepare um, and present. Um, I think this has been a really productive conversation. We hope it's a conversation that continues and special thanks to Jeff and his team at the AAAs for um, lending us this platform. I think it worked well. Um, and so we hope the conversation continues. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lauren, and everyone else.